All right, we're recording. And back to Unplugged. I'm just kidding. How about that? How about what are those castanets? <laughs> could, you, could you hear that, Chris? No, yeah, see, Jay's talking to you now. So oh, you, I heard it all. Yeah, so we, we changed his whole freaking studio around so you could hear the intro so you wouldn't fuck it up. And did I fuck this one up? No, you all sat right. there you were good. quiet. I was good. surprised. <laughs> good. So there, but I was like, what are those ca- Now it's the first time me hearing it. That's like, right. This close? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like some Spanish lady with cast- castanets. Yeah. So that, that's because you never listened to the show. How you, much did you pay for it to get... It costs a lot. This no, no, no. The cast- <laughs> for the lady with the castanets. Jay, hi- Jay hired them. He didn't show me the invoice. <laughs> Jay, how do you know people that can do that? Yeah, so, that's a secret. Yeah, I mean, we, there's, a, there's a good intro. That's the first time we had a perfect intro with no sound, and then we screwed up when we started. But anyway, welcome into the Recipe Podcast, Celebrity Secrets of Successful Life. I'm your host, Chef Charles Carroll. What a great day. What a great show we had. This is a Gourmet Club live segment. And uh, if you're a fan, you're seeing a different setup for the first time because we worked the last two weeks trying to uh, change the studio around and get, do some uh, updates. And, and um, I don't know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> I have no idea if, if this it's is a work gonna, in progress. Yeah, if this is actually going to come out or not. But uh, it's been a long time unplugging shit and putting it back in again. But we're really excited about today because we have a, a guest in the studio. We'll get to him in a second. But I uh, want to say hello to the, the lovely and talented Haley Bobbitt. How's hey, it going, what's Bob? up? Yeah, so you're doing all right. Haley's been under the weather. Did you know that, Christian? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. she's been, uh, but uh, she's here. I sent her yeah. flowers. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, that was nice of you. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of person I am. I And then we got flooded in, uh, what day was it? Two days ago? Thursday. Yeah, so Bob had slept at the, in the ladies' locker room for a while. Yep. Yeah, I heard you hooked her up. Yeah, I was like, look, I got a place for you. Yeah. And uh, it's not the nicest hotel, but. It wasn't bad, though. She, she <laughs> smells was, like mothballed. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh she goes hooked up so there, there we have it so venus flytrap good to see you man you're you're good yeah good yeah all right and and uh then we have jay back there and jay's been busy because he's been uh, unplugging all this crap and putting it back together again uh, how's it working out? How, how do you i bought your brand new desk brand new equipment how's it going over there jay it's, it's working yeah you got it to work <laughs> how do you know show. how do you know well, it's working i'm hoping yeah all right. Well, we have to get the camera on him the next time. But, uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll see how this all comes out. And then, of course, we have the world famous, the world famous no way. Charles Clark for here from Houston. Here. Welcome in, Chef. Thanks. Good to be here. First time. Yeah, yeah. Good. We've been trying to get here for a while, but you've been, you've been busy. They're working, trying to pay rent. Yeah. Pay yeah. my staff. You yeah. Know. It's hard. Well, we're, we're, uh, we have so many uh, questions for you. We- <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've done some gigs together, huh? Keep this PG-13. <laughs> we've done, so what's going on in your life, man? How how you doing? How's how's life? I'm good. Uh, just uh, working on a couple of new projects, one in the River Oaks area and one out west, uh, kind of a, an extension of Copa, a second-generation style. And that's about it, just trying to do, you know, good concepts that will stick around and, and make some money and, you know, stay in business. Let's talk about that. So, so you have, let's, I'm losing track now. Um, the Dunleavy, that's going strong. Brasserie 19, Copa, and Punks. And uh, Ibiza. And Ibiza, of course, that's your baby. In, yeah, Copa, Copa, Punks, Ibiza, uh, Brasserie, and the Dunleavy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ibiza's being uh, turned 18 years old last month. Wow. It goes by quick. Yeah. Wow. Then that's where you hang your hat most of the time. I'm always there. Um, kind of my baby. It's, you know, I just, people expect to see me there. So I, I'm i there 24 mm. 7. You know, pretty much everybody walks in the door, especially at lunch, because there's a lot of business people coming from downtown each of three to four days a week. Mm. 19 years, Christian. Mm-hmm. That's a long run. That's a good run. Now, you opened that up about the time I came to Houston. So I'm in my, I, I, I came here in 2000, so. Yeah, 2001. So, man, I've seen everything from Enron to the yeah. Iraqi war to floods <laughs> to you name it. I've been through it over there. So, so on top of all of those, uh, of all those places, you're opening up two more. Yes, uh, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, you know, I never, 
you know, count them until they'll open. But, yeah, we've signed the leases and starting construction uh, in a couple months. Hmm. Can you talk about it? Where, where, um, where in River Oaks? Um, it's near the um, Whole Foods area, okay. uh, over on Kirby and Still Street area. Okay. Yeah, it's a, a location that we've worked on. I say the lease. The lease is in front of me. i got to sign it probably Monday or Tuesday. Hmm. So uh, I'll be able to talk a little more about it then. Yeah. So um, what about concept? you want to talk about concept there yet or no? Well, it's, it's a different concept than we've done before. We, you know, we've done French, Italian, a little bit of Spanish, Southern food, and California style over at Dunleavy. This is more um, Baja, California meets San Miguel meets uh, California, L.A., clean Latin influence food, mm. but um, you know, I want to. I don't want to say the word Mexican because when you say Mexican, everyone thinks cheese enchiladas and fajitas. And don't get me wrong, we're going to have to touch on a little bit of that mm -hmm. for uh, people that come in because when you say the word Mexican, they want chips and sauce on the table. Mm. So we've got to think out that whole process and you know come mm. up with uh, the right yeah. thing. People think you know Mexican, you just feet got to stick to the floor and that kind of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Christian, I mean, uh, Jay, can I ask you a question? Um, is is three and six muted? It feels hot in my ear, but I don't know if it's three and six. You can mute those. Yeah, yeah this one's on. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you're excited uh, excited about all that? The other like, I, that kind of means no sleep, doesn't it? Well, no, the no sleep starts when you, when you, when you start hiring staff and the, because all the money is just going out mm. at a uh, – it's crazy at 100 miles an hour mm. nothing's coming in so you're watching your budget that's when it really gets crazy because you're training wait staff you're training you know the, the front of the house the managers you want everybody on the same page and that's that's the hardest part because you're pulling your hair out because simple things you know you try to explain when a customer walks in you just don't stare at them you know ask them how many in their party the fundamental things see them at the best table um, mm. you know offer them a drink within the first you know, mm. 60 seconds, mm -hmm. things like that. Fundamentals. All right, let's, so let's back up a little bit. So um, you, 19 years ago, you, you started, that was your first restaurant, right? Ibiza was your first? Ibiza was the first, yes. All right, so what, where, are you a native Houstonian? No, I grew up in Louisiana. Louisiana. And, and uh, do you go to school? <laughs> He's getting get an Cajun, uh, some Cajun <laughs> love over there. Uh, where, where, where in Louisiana? I grew up in a very exclusive trailer park. Uh -huh. um, is no it? laughs. No, no. Laughs. no. Well, I wait. I want to. I wait because I know because maybe Jay will know it. That's why I'm saying, Jay. Do you know the area? I want to see if you're close to Jay. Jay. I grew up in De Quincey, uh, a, a little town near Lake Charles, Louisiana. Mm. Jay. Yeah. Um, no, I'm further. Where's your mom's place at? In Scott, from New Orleans. Oh yeah, yeah. In Scott, near Scott. Lafayette. Yeah. Yeah, that's my be my favorite place uh, called Best Stop. Is there? Yeah, Best Stop. Best Stop. Right is down there. the street from the Best Stop. Yeah, it's a Cajun market. It is just. Man, you, when you go to New Orleans, you got to stop there. It's like the real deal, the boudin. Mm. they got the best duck crackling you've ever had in your life. Really? Oh, when you get the paper bag, when you, by the time you get to the car, it's just oil <laughs> oil on the bottom of it from the fat, and it's just really good. And you're in there eating in your car, driving to New Orleans, eating, you know, uh, crackling. It's, it's, a, it's a good experience. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, culinary school or no? Yeah, culinary school, definitely. Art Institute of Houston, uh, graduated in 96. Okay, so what brought you from uh, uh, Louisiana to here? Well, I was in Dallas. I, as soon as I graduated high school in Louisiana, um, I loaded up my piece of crap, Trans Am, mm. and, and I headed to uh, Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. This is 1981, 82. And uh, Bright Lights, big city. I grew up in Louisiana and I had two choices, to work on the railroad like all my family, or mm. go work in the gas refineries. And mm. I'm like, man, I can't, I just don't want to do that. Mm. I want to do something different. So I went to Dallas and started waiting tables and, you know, little bitty restaurants and worked my way up to fine dining. And then I decided to go to culinary school and I had a buddy that um, had a restaurant I could work at in Houston, um, you know, and I, he kept trying to get me to come to Houston. And I said, you know, it is closer to Louisiana. There's a little more the cuisines kind of just mesh here mm -hmm. you know you got the asian the louisiana culture and i said man it'd be a good place to be near the water and all that the gulf so i decided to go to culinary school in houston texas and uh graduated in 96. 
96, man, you turned that around quick. Oh, yeah, I was. I, I went to the culinary school at, at an older age. You know, I took it very serious. All these young kids were getting high in the parking lot, you yeah. know, skipping skipping class and all that. And, you know, I'm cleaning fish at 7 in the morning and trying to learn everything I can just to, you know, to jump in the water and make a, make a career. Mm. So what was your uh, – so you went to school at the Art Institute. What was your first job in Houston? Um, well, during school, I was a waiter at Post Oak Grill. I worked at Anthony's for Tony Ballone. Mm. And uh, I worked at a little restaurant, one well, a little one, but a Creole restaurant called La Nyap. It was only around a few years, but it was really way ahead of its time. And it was more fine dining, kind of like Emeril Lagazzi mm. Creole. And it was over on Post Oak, actually. And uh, I worked there for a little while. But then after I graduated, uh, that's when I, I jumped into the kitchen. Mm. Okay, and, and then what, what restaurant? Well, this is kind of a tricky thing. Um, um, when I was in culinary school, a couple of months before I graduated, a young girl, uh, a, you know, fellow student said that you, my friends are looking for a chef. Why don't you interview? And I oh, go, wow. I'm, I'm not a chef. I've wow. never worked a day in a kitchen in wow. my life. Holy shit. So, uh, yeah. So I said, oh, I'm going to go out to California, work in Napa Valley and work under a chef for like five years and do my thing. They go, well, just interview. At least you can get the practice. So I interview and the interview was to cook for 12 people. And so I, I cooked for 12 people at their home. I brought in some music. I remember I was listening to Gypsy Kings. It was very popular at the time. Don't judge me. <laughs> and um, so I made this incredible dinner, I thought, and I tore the kitchen up. Of course, they couldn't see how dirty the kitchen was. It was, you know, I, you could tell I wasn't a chef. I, I was, everything was dirty. It was, I wasn't organized, but I made really tasty food. And so I beat out six or seven other chefs for the job. So they go, we want you to... Wow. You know, be the chef. And I'm like, it was called De Capo's Cafe on the Parkway. This is 1996, over on Allen Parkway, right across from the Dunleavy. And it's about 120 seat restaurant. So I, uh, I got the job. They go, we're gonna offer you 24,000 a year. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was making almost double that as a waiter. But I knew if I pull this off, if I just got one good review or a couple good reviews then I'm on my way. I don't got to look back. And I was 34 at the time. So I'm like, man, I can't take a pay cut for too long. So I opened DeCampos Cafe on the Parkway 96 for these people. And I got incredible reviews. And I got the River Oaks crowd, the Bentleys on the parking lot, Porsches. It was just like the scene, in, you know, who, who, whoever was there. It was the River Oaks Society there. And I got really lucky, I think. And so I'm packed. And one night in the dining room, this older couple called me over and they go, hey, how would you like to uh, come work in Spain? I'm like, well, let's go. So I left a few months later and I moved to Spain. How long were you there, though? How long were you the chef there? I was in Spain for about a year, a little over a year. No, but how long were you at the... Oh, the... just so oh, I opened it in 96 and I left it probably six, seven months later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I knew that it was, it was the hardest job I'd ever had in my life and I knew... I didn't think I could keep it up and keep the reviews and keep everything consistent because I was making bread, pasta in the morning. I'd get there at 4.30 in the morning. I didn't know the ins and outs of being a chef. I didn't know you could order fresh pasta. I didn't know you could do this. I was making it all from scratch. Wow. I just thought that's the way everyone did it. Yeah. And it was killing me. And I said, yeah, I'll go to Spain. And I always wanted to live in Europe. And I got the opportunity. And uh, So what that look like? What, do you want to go to Spain to what? To, to well, well, they said, we, we have a little restaurant overlooking the bull ring in Puerto Banus, which is the south of Spain. And uh, it sounded like paradise. They said, well, why don't you just do, you know, simple American food. To me, simple American food was doing, you know, pasta, risotto, uh, steaks, things like that. So I get over there, and they, they wanted, you know, barbecue ribs, quesadillas, and hot dogs. And oh, like, shit. Oh, God, I just graduated culinary school. I'm cooking hot dogs, you know. So it was a, a three-month a three-month commitment on contract so I did it you know and people were loving the food I hated cooking and it was it was a it was crap what I consider crap over there and um, so I finished the three months and I told them I didn't want to continue the job and they said well we reported you to the authority said your work visa is no longer available so you have to leave in the next 48 hours and I said basically kiss my ass I'll do whatever I want and I met a girl at the restaurant a few days early, and she said, move in with me. So I moved in with her, and I stayed another year. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, and, and so uh, did you work on some other gigs there, or did you just go restaurant, re restaurant, and steal as much as you could, can? Or well, what? she had a little restaurant up in up in the hill, probably um, five minutes outside the city that was straight up the mountain toward Rhonda. And um, it was a little bitty restaurant, and it only had like probably 30, 40 seats. And she was the cook, and, you know, and that was pretty much it. I mean, she would had a little girl waiting on them. I said, look, I'm a waiter, so let me take care of the front of the house and, and I'll just watch you cook, and we'll, we'll work it together. So I took care of the front of the house. Didn't speak much English, but in the South, everybody speaks English. You know, there are a lot of tourists and things. So uh, I took care of the front of the house, and, I, you know, she taught me how to cook simple things like paella and how to carve uh, jamon serrano, you know, the leg of uh, the jamon. Um, she taught me – she wanted to make one thing American, and I, and I for some reason – in culinary school, I made a really good one. She says, all I want to do is make one thing. I go, what is it? She goes, I want to make a cheesecake. So, <laughs> I, made it. so I showed her how to make cheesecake. That was a trade-off. Yeah. Oh, so you enjoyed that time. And, you, and that's why after that one year you came back? Uh, after that one year I came back, and um, we uh, got together uh, Grant Cooper, my partner, Clark Cooper. He's the Cooper part. And we, um, we opened uh, a restaurant that we were only there for probably a year called Tosca Kitchen and Wine Bar. And it was a falling out of partners. Grant and I fell out with our third partner. And uh, we decided to open Ibiza, our, uh, our restaurant, you know, we, that we've been talking about. Ibiza opened in 2001. So how did you meet Grant? Grant and I met in Dallas. When I was living in Dallas, um, I just got through backpacking Europe for two months. And I walked into this bar. I'd been, only been at home for a couple of days. I was all tan. He goes, man, you're, you're really tan. I go, I just got back from Europe. He goes, well, I just got back from Europe. I go, what part were you in? I go, I was in Greece. He goes, I was in Greece. Oh, and I go, what part of Greece? He goes, Carfu. I go, that was in Carfu. <laughs> he goes, where did you stay? He goes, Pink Palace. Pink Palace is a hotel where all the Americans stay, all the English-speaking people stay. He goes, I was at Pink Palace, and so we hit it off. We missed each other by about a week. Um, and, you know, what are the chances of two guys, you know, yeah. in, in the same part of the world for – a couple of weeks so we we became really good friends because he had grew up in europe and um he had had a, he had a kind of a style and a taste for european food and wine and in in dallas and you know when you're in your uh, you know young 20s you know most people are into beer and nachos and he liked you know fine dining and stuff like that so we said man let's open a restaurant one day just joking and it happened so he's a young young guy Grant's young. He was younger than me. He, uh, he's probably three years younger than me. So where did the two of you go get the money to open up a visa? We had a customer at uh, Tosca, remember, in 98 when we opened Tosca. And he just he said, look, I love the food. Uh, I know you're from Louisiana. I'm from Louisiana. We, we grew up probably 20 minutes apart from each other. He was a little older than me. He said, if you ever want to do a restaurant, let me know. So we had an idea that we wanted to do before Tosca. So what we did is... Um, when we left Tosca, we approached and we said, look, this is our idea. We want to open a restaurant, but we want to sell wine at almost a retail, a retail price. We want to sell wine where it's very approachable, where you're not getting screwed. And uh, he goes, well, you know, it sounds interesting. I'd saw the concept in uh, Kansas City at a restaurant. They, you walk in at Silver Oak. I mean, I know a lot of people are cheesy wine. But that's just one example. But Silver Oak was like, you know probably 43 dollars mm. you know what was uh, it in that restaurant it was called classic cup okay. and it might still be around but man they were selling wine so cheap and i couldn't believe it and so i'm there by myself i go let me get a bottle of this a bottle of this i can take it with me i mean when you're seeing you know a 150 dollar bottle for you know like 45 50 dollars yeah. you're like oh man if you're usually drinking something that, are, that is 40 dollars and then you see a hundred dollar bottle that's only 55 then you're going to jump up to that next level mm -hmm. And drink like a you know a Heights, you know vineyard or something, or, or, or you know jump up to another level, a, a, a red burgundy or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he liked the idea, and um, the trick to it is you you got to do volume. You got to sell a lot of wine, kind of like the Costco effect. You know, you bring in, uh, you get better buying deals too. So if you're if you're well, like Brasserie 19, we sell more Vuvuzela than anybody in the state. We have. Sometimes they'll drop 20 cases before a weekend. You know, we got wine wow. stacked up everywhere, and people know that you can drink uh, Vuclico cheaper at Brasserie 19 than you can buy it at Specs sometimes. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah, the, uh, they're pretty close to the price that we pay wholesale at the club. Yeah. And and that's just the way, I mean. It's, it's a, a loss leader, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's a loss leader, but, you know, you get anybody that, the way I think, anybody that drinks champagne, when they come in, they're going to go, you know what? Oh, you got beluga caviar? Let me get a, an ounce of beluga yeah. caviar. Let me get this. Let me get this. You know, so we, or even if they're coming in for Vuv, they'll be like, they'll look at something like a vin, like a vintage champagne and be like, hey, you know exactly. what? Let's step it up. Exactly. Oh, you know, I didn't know you had Krug. Let me get this Krug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that so that started. Uh, that was two thousand. So for some of the listeners, I like to get down into down into the dirt a little bit. So what did you start that restaurant with? It was you and your partner. Your partner did he. he I, I'm assuming he didn't have much to put into the restaurant, or, or I don't no, know why I assume that. No, Grant and I didn't have a penny to our name. Really. Okay. So I, re I remember a few months before we opened uh, Ibiza, we had grabbed all of our change out of the couch and on the floor in our apartment. <laughs> we were roommates. And, and then, you know, they had that machine at Randall's where you can just pour your change in yeah, and it yeah, counts yeah. it for you, and it keeps like 4%. <laughs> we did that to pay our electricity bill. We didn't have any money yeah. and uh you know and people think that when you open a restaurant that you you know oh it must have make a lot of money or whatever even if the restaurant's busy but you're not you're paying down debt for the first four or five years yeah you sure know? you don't have a pot to piss in and um so we we opened tosca and you know had the the, the falling out in 98 and then we opened abiza in 2001 and um we were busy at abiza and it was popular it was great and we were paying down the debt and um so we in 2005 four years after that we said look we want to buy out our partner hmm. yeah. so, so let's take a look at that because yeah. i'm always interested in that so you, you and grant um you go in you have no money your partner comes in and say hey i'll help you guys out by the way what role does grant have in the you're the chef slash front of the house what is i call grant the touchy feely person <laughs> so he does, does <laughs> as he a work? compliment he's he's good at what he does he's he works the door? Well, no, uh, Grant, um, he does not in operations as much anymore. He, 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 you know, he eats at all the restaurants and he, um, he oversees, uh, personnel as far as, um, director of operations, uh, food quality, uh, function of restaurant, um, like the new one, he you know he he works on the lease. Then he brings me in and says, "These are the lease numbers. What do you think?" And I go, "Okay, we need to work on this part. Do this part." And he's the one in the meetings at eleven o'clock when I'm in the restaurant because gotcha. it's, it's lunchtime and I, I'm I've got to be at the restaurant. So he's in the meetings doing all this and negotiating. And then I come in after and sit down when it's you know when Close. when the cake is made and ready to eat. Yeah. And then we'll 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 put our heads together and go, "Okay, we can't do this. Can't do this. Or we can do this." And we move on. And, you know, then we start, you know, hiring uh, contractors and things to build a restaurant. And so in 2000, right? 2000, 2001. 2001. 2001. Yeah. This guy comes along. What was the initial? What What was his initial? He uh, was in the imaging business. He uh, in the woodlands. He uh, uh, MRIs and stuff. And um, most of those guys are full of crap. Not imaging guys, but most guys. Well, I don't want to invest in restaurant. They're mm -hmm. full of crap until it comes down to sign the dotted line. Mm -hmm. But he was very serious about it and. And we gave him a, a business plan and said, that, you know, it, it, it's right at a million dollars, nine hundred and fifty thousand, which was not crazy amount of money back then. And um, he um, he said, here's what I'll do: I'll I'll put the collateral up, but I'll we'll borrow the money from the bank, but I'll put the collateral up for the loan, and you guys are responsible for the loan plus you know ten percent or whatever it was. And so we started paying the loan back, and, and we were accelerating it and thinking as soon as we pay this loan back we can make more money mm. so we were doing probably around uh, 45 55 thousand a week which is not a big number but we said look we would like to buy you out but 20 years ago that's yeah it's a good number yeah it's a good number yeah especially selling it was at the price at the price points that we we're yeah. selling so we um we made him an offer we negotiated an offer and he says okay you can buy me out but he didn't want to get he didn't want to be bought out but we we said look man we just we want to be on our own so he said, okay, it's 450000 to buy me out. He had already got his money back from the restaurant, you know, already made his money. He said, 450 and it's yours. Okay, so I need to think about this in a second. But he put up the collateral, just meaning, meaning that you can get the million-dollar loan. Yeah. Okay, but he didn't really have to put any money no, in. No, no. Right. So, but, but, he, but he, you were kicking out 10% to him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, 
So he was he really had no skin in the game other than other than if you guys fold, he's stuck with that. Exactly. If we folded, he would have been had to pay the loan back. Okay. So that was a good deal for him if you got well, he's a there's he a had risk. a lot of risk. Yeah, there's a risk there. That's, he had all the yeah. risk. So after year what, you asked him to buy him out? Two thousand five. Five years. We want to buy you out. And he gave us a number, four hundred and fifty thousand. I remember that number. Wow, shit. And it's a lot of money. Yeah. But he said in don't get me wrong. You know, maybe he's a great businessman or what he said. Uh, if you're late with one payment, it goes back to the original number. Oh, fuck. If I'm late with one payment, say I pay him three hundred seventy-five thousand. If I'm late with the that, pay, the you go back to the original. You go back to four hundred fifty. That's jacked up, yeah. man. So we did it. We said, "What the hell?" So <laughs> the, the day we did it, I swear I don't know what happened, but our sales increased so much by double. We started doing a hundred thousand a week because you risked it. I don't know. You willed it there. I don't know. We started doing 80, 90, 100,000 a week, Shit. and we paid him back, and we never missed a note. Did you have to pay him the 10% during that no, time? No, no, no. Okay, just 450,000. Gotcha. gotcha. Straight. It was like a 36 month. So now you're paying. It was like 10 grand a month. Yeah. So now yeah. you're paying his note and the bank note. Yeah, exactly. And I remember we paid him off. I was like, I told my accountant, I said, make sure he knows that's the last check. She goes, he knows. <laughs> so, uh, and then I remember a year later, they go, okay, we only got 12 more months on. Wood Forest Bank. That was the bank. I go, you only owe them another year. We paid that off, and then uh, we were doing so good when we built Copa years later. I didn't know what the term organic meant as far as, oh, you built it organically. I didn't know what that meant. Some banker said that. I'm like, what is it? What do you mean? He goes, we, what we did, we built punks as we were building Copa, and we built it organically means that you built it out of your own cash flow. Mm. We did not take one penny from a bank to build it. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so we got lucky with that. Mm. Wow. So after six or seven years, wh when were you when were you debt free from both? From well, Ibiza was you know at about seven or eight years, but we built a lounge next door and we went way over budget, a half a million dollars uh, to to build out fifteen hundred square feet. And that was a seven year loan, so we paid that off in uh, thirteen. 2012 or 13, and um, paid brasserie off in 18 months, a million dollars. 18 months, man. Brasserie is crazy, right? Brasserie is crazy. That was a, a cool deal because we had a banker goes, hey, uh, you guys are doing really well. Um, how much do you need for brasserie? I go, we need 800000 because it's a second-generation restaurant. I mean, it's got a kitchen, bathrooms, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So we – we uh all we need was 800 so he goes okay here's the first 400 we, so we spent that 400 and we're halfway finished he goes well i can't loan you the rest uh you know went extended i'm like what so we went up to this guy which is a member of country club steve webster he was a great he is a great guy but he said if you ever need money let me know i'd love to be partnered with you guys and i remember walking up to steve webster and i said hey man we're short 400,000, and uh, we can probably come up with a couple hundred of ourselves because i'll do it all he reaches in his pocket and writes a check for 400000 on a handshake. On a handshake. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Old, old school deal, He's man. a good dude. He's a good, oh, good dude. Oh, man. He's one of the best guys ever. Yeah. And um, it made me feel so good because we paid him back so quick. You know, it's almost like he didn't want to get paid back that quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we paid him back so quick, and we paid off the restaurant in 18 months. It was, it was, it was I mean, we projected – the restaurant that was there before us, I talked to Mr. Mandola. I said, what was your best year in 20 years at this spot? He goes, man, I did I did 4.3 million like year nine or something. His best year was 4.3 million. Our first year, we did 8.8 .8 million. Did you know that about the numbers no. at the Brasserie, bro? Yeah, that's wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So our best year was factory. 10 million. 10? We did 10 million the third year. And there's only 80 seats, isn't there? Isn't there something? No, 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 no. It's uh, 135 inside, and then there's another 50 outside. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the outside, it, it's bigger than you would think. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, the, Christian, what, what do you got over there? You got something you want to share? Yeah. Do you want to try some wine? <laughs> Man, that's, that's my business. <laughs> but so, so with this renovation going on over there, has, has that jacked with you guys at all? You know, it was, it was very, very scary. Uh, Hanover is building it. And we probably talked to them for a year before construction started. And uh, we, we talked about every aspect. Hey, we're going to lose gas. Oh, we're going to lose water. We're going to lose electricity. Mm. And they, uh, they assured us we're going to do it like this. If When we change over the gas and we do things like that, we're going to do that at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. Mm. Um, so they were very organized, and we've got past 
all the really really hard part mm. so I'm, I'm impressed they've they've done a good job but they've got a track record they've built several around the city so christian t- tell us what we're doing here before we uh, get in the next yeah question. just real quick this is uh 17 by panea see uh, the label's all wet sorry it was in the fridge the um you notice that that green oh, that's the master's green no oh, it is this it, wine yeah. was a made a wine made in collaboration with sergio garcia when he won the uh we won the Masters in 17. Same year, got married in Austin. It's California wine? Nope, this is from Spain. Okay. Oh, so Rioja? It's, yeah, it's from Ribera del Duero. Oh, yeah. I know yeah. that area well. Yeah, so Ribera, and um, this is the second label. The the flagship label is called Panea. Yeah. There's a couple of Houston guys that are in this as well, as well as myself, and uh, a guy from Fort Worth, actually. Yeah. But good project. I mean, 100% Tempranillo. A lot of the fruit that goes in here is 35 plus year old vines and the flagship vines all 80 to 100 year old vines yeah i love spain i've got a special place in my heart well spain. cheers Here, here's cheers. a net for the next two uh Salute. two two restaurants and that you're oh, opening man, up and i hope so yeah your name comes up a lot there's a guy named uh ferguson who i just said last name ferguson he said he's a builder guy yeah yeah he was Sitting at some tasting, started talking oh, about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Builder guy, yeah. shit. I see his no, name all over the place. No, right? Ferguson. Huh? Right? I huh? think we're doing a project. The, the the one out west. I think. That's yeah, that's him. it. That's yeah, it. Yeah, he's doing something called District West. That's what we're doing, and yeah. Um, yeah, good old boy, country boy, but but he knows his stuff. Yeah, and he knows wine too. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He was sitting at a luncheon, um, with oh, with Ferragamo. So it was Salvatore Fer- <laughs> This was on Tuesday at but lunch Dam- with Salvatore Ferragamo. Huh? Damien's or, or is that? Uh, Akira- we were at Backstreet. Oh, Backstreet. We Backstreet. Okay, yeah. On, on I heard Tuesday. he was in town. Yeah, Ferragamo? Yeah. Yeah, he sat across from me and he was looking. He's like, is that a Ferragamo tie? I was like, what do you think? Oh, my God. Well, because I only have one and I was like, I'm going to wear it. I'll see if he. He if asked he can- you that? Swear to God. Holy cow. I love Ferragamo. Well, he sat right here and uh, yeah. Ferguson sat right here. Yeah. He starts yapping. He's like, about this restaurant out west. And, I got to talking to him because he knew a few people I knew. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, he said he was behind that project. So your name gets thrown around all the time. Well, man, I hope uh, – you know, this is a big stretch for us. We've never done anything outside the loop. Yeah. And this mm. is the first one. But if you see the what he's building, it looks like something you would see in Spain. You know, it's all stucco, beautiful villa-looking. And where is this doorways. at? You say at West. If you go straight up uh, West Park Tollway, past Royal Oaks and all that, you see right off the exit, practically. Yeah. Peak. Yeah. Peak is the exit. You just take a left, it's right there. Wow. Well, they're building it now. It's a probably a three, four-year project. So West Park, is it? So there's a lot of traffic out there then? Yeah, there is. There's a lot of, uh, you know, Cinco, Cinco Ranch, I think. Is out Everybody's there. buying their homes out there. The guys that work at the club who are, you know, trying to look for a place to live, whatever, a lot of them are buying out there. They're just coming right up West Park or straight up mm. Westheimer. Yeah. Mm. One or the other. Mm. But that's far out. You can get a lot of money a lot of house for the money there you go yeah. i mean if you don't mind commuting yeah yeah commute. and, and ferguson the thing about him what makes him so good is he wants good restaurants out there he doesn't want chains and want you know crap restaurants and stuff he wants really good restaurants and we said this is what it takes to get us out there and we said no way he's going to do that and he goes yeah we'll we'll do that no problem yeah he's smart yeah smart guy. yeah you can yeah. tell you can tell he's all in yeah he is so, all in so that uh, what is that 10 miles up from here? 10 miles, you think? 10 miles from the center? Yeah, it's like 10 miles. 10 to 12 miles? Yeah, that's about right. So, and so you're going to keep, all the all the other restaurants are going to stay strong, right? And you're going to open up the other two? Yeah, definitely. Um, I brought a chef in from L.A. Um, about in January. And uh, he's been on board a little early, but it was just timing. You know, he's really, really good. So he's been doing a lot of, uh, you know, research and development for us. Okay, so did you put them like a, uh, a week or two in each restaurant so you can get a feel for all the gigs or don't even bar- No, 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 I do, yeah. yeah. I put them in a brasserie, copa, punks, mostly those three. Mm. Mm. So so what's the what's the timeline for these two places? Um, the one in River Oaks hopefully opened by February, <clears throat> and then uh, District West is um, a year from February. February. So yeah, February. Let me ask, let me ask a question. You, you were... You were involved with uh, Catalan as well, yeah? Yes. That was yeah, ours. because I remember when I f- first moved here, Catalan's the first restaurant. That's on, That was on Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember it well. Right? Yeah. yeah. With um, Chris Shepard. Yeah. Shepard. You guys yeah. worked together on it, yeah? Mm-hmm. Were, were you partners on that? Yes. Uh, Grant and I owned it, and uh, we uh, approached Chris Shepard uh, to do a five-year contract. 
as a partner and uh, and possibly you know longer and so uh and, and <coughs> i know right. you know antonio gianola sure yeah so we approached both them they called it the dream team because he was at demarco at the time yeah so chris shepherd wasn't even cooking he was do he was called the wine guy yeah Brands. he was a wine in guy. fact guess what i competed against chris shepherd in 2004 listen to this this will give you an idea how far <coughs> the wine uh culture here has moved forward in 2004 i competed in Best young psalms around the world. I mean, uh, on this side of the world yeah, or whatever yeah. competition, and I won for the Caribbean. And wow. believe it or not, Chris Shepard is the wine guy at Brennan's, who was really a chef. Yeah. He knew a little bit about wine. There's no question. He knew a good bit. He was the representative for the South. That'll go to show you what the quality of the wow. psalms were. And I'm not trying to put anybody down. Yeah. But when I was competing from the Caribbean, I came up. I remember, and I was like, "Where do you work?" And he's and he had it. Yep. Everybody else was chef dressed in jacket. a suit. But he had a chef jacket on. I said, the white guy. We were like, where'd this guy come from? I mean, I've never seen a son wearing a chef costume. I know. It was kind of unique in a way. And, yeah. and I, I, I went up to him. I said, Chris, you and I went to school together. What are you selling wine? Come yeah. on, man. I know you like to cook. And I go, I'm opening a place. I want to name it Catalan because I lived in Spain in Catalan. I just, I remember reading this magazine. It said, the sun laid on her beautiful body like the catalan sun laid wow. on her beautiful dark body that, that's why you remember and it. i'm like i remember that <laughs> and so uh sounds like gypsy kings again <laughs> yeah it does so i say i got an idea for catalan he goes i'm in and uh i remember uh uh we offered him uh, i think it was like fifty thousand to come on board he's probably making 45 i go look i'll match whatever you're making right now and then once we open i'll bump you up another 20 grand and uh, the owners of Brennan's, I've, I guess they found out that conversation and told him. So the, the day before I left, they gave him a $10,000 raise. So he went from like 40 to 50. So I had to match 50. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. It's chicken shit, man. <laughs> yeah. You know? So anyway, he came on board and they both signed five year contracts. And um, a few months before the contract was up, Chris sat down with us and he started tearing up and crying and said, I mean, man, I'm leaving. I'm doing my own thing. It's, and, um, I go, well, man, I, as long as you better yourself, I wish you nothing but the best. Yeah. And, and you're bettering yourself by doing your own restaurant. And he goes, well, I go, what's the name going to be? And he told me the name. I go, man, that's a weird name, Underbelly. I never heard of Underbelly. So, anyway, that, that's where it came from. Yeah. So, I, I hate to stop the conversation, but I, I forgot to do the sponsor. So, Jay, if you could help me out with that. I'm can, I, can I talk over these? Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be cool or not. Uh, I get myself in trouble, but we we need to stop real quick to talk about our sponsors, and without them, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So, Dunkin' Coffee, really cool company um, that serves fantastic coffee. They are a, a complete uh, tea and coffee service, whether you're in um, freestanding restaurants or hotels or restaurants. So, very cool. Um, Aceway Incorporated. These guys will clean anything from office buildings to kitchens, and that's why we love them because they do a great job for us and uh, real attention to detail. And that's Ricardo Ace Vito. Fantastic service there. Texas Beef Council, we love them because they love chefs, and if you're not eating beef, there's something wrong with you. The Scuffia School of Culinary Arts and American Culinary Federation, we thank all you guys for trusting us. And American Culinary Federation, Bob and I are going to do a sh do shows on location, right, Bob? Are you still going to do that? You've been awful quiet today. Yeah. Yeah. She's been on under the weather. Yeah. You're better now? You look like you're better. All right. All right. All right. So anyway, we're going to go to the American Culinary Federation. So, so sorry for the interruption, but... Um, uh, Catalan, that was that was a fantastic restaurant. I remember eating there, and, and, and you know what? I remember that those damn foie gras bonbons. bonbons. Holy shit, man! Those things yeah. are awesome. Yeah, and that was a great restaurant. So why'd you guys close? When did you close up? And why'd you close up shop? Well, there? Antonio and Chris both wanted to. Uh, well, but mostly it was Chris because we couldn't carry on without Chris. He's such a big personality, and um, we just said, man, you know, without Chris. It, it, you know, he was kind of coming into his thing, and mm -hmm. he had a lot of followings of other chefs and stuff. He was cooking whole pigs out front of the restaurant, and all this stuff. And I just said, man, it's we're not, not gonna we're not gonna find a chef like that. Let's change the concept to Copa because we, gotcha. we'd always had Copa in mind, and and we only had a few years left <laughs> on the lease. So we said, let's change it to Copa, and then we'll build Copa and Rice Village, and then we'll let that lease expire. And like a year before it expired, we had a, a Mexican restaurant that wanted this spot and. We basically sold them tables and chairs. We didn't make any money, but you know, yeah. we got out of the lease because Washington was it just turned into more of a club, yeah, you know, a yeah. clubby. Yeah, kind your timer was good to, to yeah. till out of there. We got out. A lot of our clientele would not want to come over there after seven o'clock at night. Yeah, 
It was a shit show out there. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it, it happened quick. But I remember going to Catalan's the first restaurant they took me to because I took the job as the wine director for the tasting room, Max's Wine Dive. Yeah, yeah, group. yeah. Larry so, Lasco? Jerry Lasco, yeah. Oh, so my Las- God. So they take me to Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> Strong character, but you know what? Everybody in town who's worth the shit has worked there at some point. Yeah. But I go, I went, uh, I went to Catalan, and I was like, damn, this is. And it was nice to see Chris again because I hadn't seen him in seven years. I yeah. From '04, and I was like, I only know two people in Houston when I moved here. And there, who's there? I mean, Chris the Shepard and R- Dr. Ravana, who I met in St. Yeah. Thomas back in '01. And I was like, these are two good yeah. people to know. Yeah. But what, what I'm getting at, it was a, a couple of guys that always came to the tasting room uh, uptown. It was uh, Steve Webster, Steve Ford, and uh, Stevenson. Mark, Mark Stevenson. Stevenson, yeah. So those three guys would roll, and they were, I'm telling you, they were tasting room every day. So yeah. they, they, they were at tasting room or Max's, or in between, they were at your restaurant. Yeah. So I go to lunch there and run into Webster, and I remember seeing Webster in front, and I'm like, they were talking, they were talking about the country club because they were members at River Oaks. Yeah. I said, one day we'll all be able to hang out in some way without me having to bust my ass, bring you wines. <laughs> it's funny, years later, it's like, now, Steve Ford and uh, Steve Ford and Webster are members of the club. Yeah, those guys, and so I I see them all the time and yeah. they're friends and we've traveled to wine country in different places before. Steve owns, you know, he owns. Evenland. Yeah, 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 yeah. He owns Evenland, and and obviously that connection with the wine, and I knew all those wines because you know Ravana's out there with in Oregon as well, so I knew the Seven Springs Vineyard. Yeah. Anyway, it's a big circuit of of people who were connected. But ultimately, I started uh, seeing them at the club and taking care of them at the club. They got their wish. I ended up coming to work close to the home to where they were. Yeah. And then Stevenson ended up getting remarried. He got remarried at the club. Yeah. So yeah. it all, you know, it, it, that circle is so tight. And Webster was always involved. You saw him like he's always at one of those places. And then eventually, I got to hear. I was like, well, he's partnered with them now at this point. So yeah. I was like, that's great. Mm. He's a great. He's a good, good dude. Oh so. man, he's the best customer ever. Mm. So, what uh, what what scares you to death right now? Competition. <laughs> it's just I, I was saying earlier. It's just I don't know where these young chefs, man. They come up and they get their money to open not even one but two concepts at a time, and it's just you know it's a different time out there than it was 15 years ago. Yeah, man. There's a lot of competition out there. Jesus. I, Christ. I remember I was doing bone marrow in '98. And no one was doing bone marrow. You'd sit in New York on the East Coast, and now. You know, you almost see bone marrow at Luby's Cafeteria, you know, mm-hmm. and <laughs> things like that. It's just, yeah. it, it's, it, you know, octopus, foie gras, all that stuff, you know. Uh, it's just, it's so mainstream now. You go to Costco and buy fully cooked octopus now in yeah. the uh, deli section almost. Well, well, the way the progression goes, it's like everybody, all the rich folks who are, in, you know, famous folks with too much money, when you have too much money, the thing, the next thing they always wanted to do like their pet project was, I want to open a restaurant. Yeah. Then they realize how hard the restaurant business is. Mm. Their wealth got bigger, so now their thing is like, I want to own a winery, like Brad yeah. and Angelina Jolie. Mm. Now they want to own a winery, even though that's a tough investment as well. So in here in Houston, we have so many people who have like movie star money. Yeah. The first thing they want to get involved in is a res- is restaurants because mm. they go, like to go out to eat and they go to travel. Wherever they travel, they want to bring back the idea. So there are, there are a lot of guys here in town, young and you know middle aged, who have that kind of disposable income to say, hey, I don't give a shit. I just want to have a restaurant that I can go to. I don't even care if it makes money. I had a customer one night. He comes in. He goes, I'm going to open a restaurant with my son. You know, we we had a, we have an accounting company. He'd been around for 20 years. And and uh, I go, you going to open a restaurant? He goes, yeah. I go, you ever did it? He goes, no, we don't have any experience in it. But, you know, I think we're going to do it. I go, so what do you do? He goes, we own an accounting firm. I go, okay, I'm, I'm going to open an accounting firm tomorrow, and I have no experience. You think I'll be successful? He goes, no way. You have no idea what you're doing. I'm like, point made. Yeah. And he didn't speak to me for five years. Mm. We now we're friends, but he never opened that restaurant, i tell you that. But mm. it, it makes sense. I mean, like you said, people, they have this movie star money, and they think the restaurant is shaking hands, opening a bottle of wine, eating food. They don't see the two cooks that called in sick the day before. They don't see... Yeah. Um, the electricity going out. They don't see when your credit card system goes down and you can't use those knuckle busters anymore because there's no texture to yeah. the credit card. Yeah. You've got <laughs> it's over. How do you do this? What do you tell – in trying to get information from a customer when you, your credit card machines don't work and the, nobody wants to give up information, personal information. Right. So it, it's kind of – there's a lot of a lot of problems that can happen in the business. So these two new places that you're opening, um, it's still just you and your partner, Right. 
Yes. Or do you have it's just the two of you? No, right? no. On these, we we brought in two other partners uh, mm. out of the woodlands, and um, there are some guys that are very good customers of Copa, and they want to expand the Copa brand. And so we sat down and talked about um, how to move Copa forward, and we asked what other concepts we had, and uh, you know, and of course, I offered it to Webster first, and Webster got his hands full with everything else, and he goes, "No, nah, you have my blessing. Do whatever you want." So we're doing uh, two different projects with this new group, and uh, you know they wanted a, a hospitality. So Webster branch. is still still involved. Yeah, I mean, he's still a partner. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and, and I'm surprised you wanna you you wanna partner again. Uh, well, to move fast, sometimes when deals deals come up, you, you, you have to bring in money from other parts. If you go to a bank and try to borrow money nowadays, it's a nightmare. Six months eight months to get a loan things like that but uh in banks don't give money on restaurants so the so, investments yeah so the partnership uh, when you talk about a partnership then th those are partnerships that are gonna they're, they're they're evergreen i mean they're gonna they're gonna continue on you're not gonna just get to a certain point and pay them off they're gonna be partners as long as that project keeps going yeah they on this project yes what we want to do is grow the cope uh, the copa brand or uh, you know a brand and maybe sell it off after 15 or 20 units Gotcha. So we're trying to do that. We'll see. That's the dream. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Well, interesting. Interesting. Did I come on radio show and hang out on Saturdays and do yeah. stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, what the hell? Why not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, any um, any advice for, uh, for you know, Christian and I are going to open up a restaurant tomorrow. What advice do you give us? Just be consistent on whatever you do. Um, like they – I know it's corny, but I always heard people say – 90% of success is showing up and you know you're in the business I mean how many times you call an air conditioning got to fix your air conditioning yeah, yeah. the guy who shows up you know like you, you feel so much better when you see oh I, guy got here on time he's ready to do it just show up and do do whatever you said you're going to do in the restaurant business just do it mm -hmm. if you if you say you're going to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning food's going to be here at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock just be consistent in whatever you whatever you say you're gonna do. Just follow it up because I think most people look at that as, uh, you know, the, the the proof is in the pudding type thing. Yeah. What do you think about um, the food courts? Not food court. What do you, food halls? What do you think about the food hall thing? I think there's um, there's a brand new one opening up downtown. I think that's gonna be like the fourth one or third one. And have you seen these, Christian? Yeah, that's a uh, Shepherd Shepherd Ross. Yeah, we we consulted for one called the Lyric. Uh, we just we yeah. did a two year contract with them. It ended uh, a couple months ago, and I think um, I think it's kind of like the bagel shops of the '90s. You know, they all open everywhere, and and I, I don't think there might be one left, maybe two. Yeah. But I just yeah. think it's I just do the math in my head, and I mean, who's going to go downtown at you know eight o'clock on a Monday night and eat at a food hall? I just don't see it happening. But I could be wrong, but you know, and people go to Italy in New York, yeah. over on Fifth Avenue, and don't get me wrong with that place, but you got eight million people in yeah. the city during yeah. the daytime, Copy that. and it's packed. Right. You know that, and it's a tourist spot. Yeah, but on top of all a that. lot of people with that movie store money, like, like you're talking about, they they see things like this. They don't know that those concepts don't travel to Houston. They don't. So they don't travel well. Some concepts they just don't travel well. You can't open a caviar bar in Houston. You'll be dead on a Tuesday night at 7.30. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Like eight years ago or so, ten years ago, there was a big craze with meatballs in, in New York. Now, you know yeah. this, right? Yeah. And they had restaurants that were dedicated to meatballs, duck yeah. meatballs, seafood meatballs, right? You know, yeah. any kind of – and they were doing all right. And that concept trickled over to here. Thank God nobody picked it up. The only place that gave it a shot was Central Market, and they did a meatball-like bar that lasted all of like – Three months. Yeah. And that was it. So that what I like about that is there's almost a filter between the coast to here to where some of those concepts that don't have sustainability, they don't even make it here. Yeah. And I hope nobody jumps into the fire and does stuff, you know, picks up on concepts like that that are ridiculous because here in Houston, ultimately, it's going to fail even faster because nobody's into, yeah. you know, nobody's nobody here in Houston. People like their routine more, more than any other place I've ever been. Their routine is everything. And a lot of those guys at the club, you can count on where they're going to be every single hour, every single week, on a on a loop. 
Yeah. That's crazy, but it's true. And mm -hmm. you watch them, it's like they work out on this day, they play tennis on that day, they eat with us at the club on Tuesday, yeah. they go at Brasserie on Thursday. Yeah. And I knew that because on Thursday nights, half of our dining room was sitting at Brasserie 19 for the first three, four yeah. years we were open. Yeah. But if you follow those trends and you look at it, it's like what's good in Houston is if people, the good operators here, they don't jump on the next new concept yeah. or the next new chef or anything like that. And I hope that's that remains that way. Well, that, that place, Lyric, I mean, they're, they're, it seems to be really high end. It's very high end. They're trying to bring out East Coast talent. Uh, you know, we secured two or three concepts for them out of Brooklyn. Oh, well, Roberta's out of Brooklyn, and they're coming to town. But they don't want to do a bunch of satellite restaurants, which, you know, that was our idea. We wanted, they wanted to do, you know, East Coast, West Coast, you know, stuff that Houston hasn't seen before. You know, to make it more intriguing to go down there and hang out. So, uh, do you think it's going to be a reverse uh, kind of uh, income concept, where whereas you're going to grab all that uh, Monday through Friday business and the and the and, and the and the the people that are working downtown Monday through Friday, so they'll be slamming during the week, and then maybe pick up some of that theater stuff. Or what's your what do you think about that? I think lunches and you know would be off the hook down there. Yeah, you know. But, but there's the tunnels. I don't know if you've ever been to the tunnels. I haven't there. still. Oh, my God. You go, the tunnels are cool. They're packed till about 1.45, 2 o'clock, and then they're dead. There's nothing down there. And I find even, you know, all my customers at Ibiza who work downtown, after 5 o'clock, they don't want to be downtown. They want to get home. I don't care if they live in the woodlands or whatever. They just want to get home, whether it's a restaurant near their house or whatever, but they just don't want to be downtown. Man. Right. And Houston is hell bent on making downtown like a bustling, and I don't blame them. I wish it was bustling like yeah. New York or Chicago, yeah, 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 but yeah. you know we'll see. Yeah, cool. Christian, anything else? It's not built for that. I mean, it's, it's no. so hot for most of the year. Yeah. yeah. Who the hell's gonna? And now that you have the, and since you have the tunnels, it's like if you have to move in between, you don't have to cross streets. You could just move through the tunnels. But That's I mean, true. who wants to walk? On ground when it's 100 degrees and 100% humidity. There's only one place I like downtown. It's been there f longer than any any bar or restaurant uh, is uh, La Carafe. You know La Carafe Wine Bar? Yeah, it was like the original, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I've been yeah, there yeah. since like 62. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, it feels like New Orleans in there. And they take cash only. Well, yeah, the cash only. Yeah. <laughs> La Carafe, yeah. yeah. And the best few bucks in the city. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, good That's for cool. you on that. What, uh, other than, you know, people... What, what do you think has is, is been a tribute to your success? Oh, man, that's a good question. I, I just I just think um, Grant and I busting our butt day in, day out, being the face of the restaurant. I think same for Tony Ballone. Why is Tony Ballone still around to this day? He's known for being in his restaurant when you go there. It's life, too. Yeah, Donna. And uh, I just think you don't see that many places anymore. And, um, you know, I see it a little bit in New York and uh, – I like old school places like Cipriani or Nello or something like that in New York. And those places are dying out. Everything else is, you know, you got a little 17-year-old hostess that doesn't know who the VIPs are anymore and they don't give you the best table. And, you know, you know, it, this is the kiss-ass business. We're here to to uh, kiss asses, and, uh, yeah. and, and that's what it is. And, and people in River Oaks and uh, the nice neighborhoods, they want – they just want to be treated with respect and, you know, get a good table and maybe have the chef come over, talk to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you deal with them every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good people. Yeah. Well, good for you, man. What, uh, who's been an inspiration for you? Who's one of your biggest inspirations? Cooking or just anything? I don't know. Maybe, may, I want to say maybe Houston-wise. While, while, while you're opening up your first restaurant, um, who's been an inspiration to you to – or anybody you, you know, we've had some really cool shows. We had Johnny Caraba and 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 uh, and um, uh, Nico Nico, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and uh, who else? Some of the other guys were on that. Monica Poe. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and we have Chris Shepard too. And and we, the, I love the history, you know, the Pete and the Papas, uh, you know, the Papas who helped. Uh, Robert Del Grande. Yeah. And Robert yeah. I mean, all, all those stories were kind of like interweaved. I'm, yeah. I was trying to. No, they you're are. in there. You're in there as well. Yeah, sure. I come on the latter part, but uh, but yeah, Johnny Carabas. That's the one that come up because I remember going in the Carabas, the old one, 
and uh, used to be a, an adult bookstore. That's right. <laughs> it was an adult bookstore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's he, so funny. That's yeah, not story. many people know that it was an adult bookstore. He Jeff took, knows it really well. He no, took, well, he took I, it over. I, I, I don't want to say the joke, but uh, I, you know, I've heard Johnny speak now a, a bunch of times, and, and there'll be some of our members in the audience who said, "I see so and so sitting in, in the in the front seat here. He's the only guy who was he was a he was a customer before we opened, and then after." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That sounds, just like, that sounds just like Johnny, man. He's a uh, funny guy. Yeah, but uh, yeah, he was definitely inspiration. Uh, you know, you hear stories about the Papas, Chris Papas and him, how they would take uh, trash cans um, we at the get end of the night. night. Yeah. At the end of the night, they'd take trash cans and empty them in the parking lot and, and go through and find silverware and show the, the bus boys or waiters, see all the silverware, see the stuff in the garbage? And they would actually pick through the garbage, and that was that's a true story. And I'm like, good. wow. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Mm. Yeah, I think if I was an owner, I'd be like that too. Like, I, honestly, I'm not I'm trying to say I'm not a good steward of, of of the club or any place I worked in, in the past. Yeah, but you stop and think about that. It's like if it's just my if this is my own deal, I wouldn't. Be, if I saw like let's say you walk by, you see somebody sticking gum under the table, I might cut that person's hand off. See, that's the way I feel every day. Man. Yeah, I you know I freak out at the restaurant because nobody cares like the owner. Nobody. You know this can be laying on the floor in the middle of the dining room. Everyone will step over this except for the owner will reach over and pick it up. And I'm like, guys, you you, you don't see that? You can't see yeah. this yeah, on yeah. the black carpet or whatever. Yeah. No one cares like the owner. Is there, is there someone in Houston that that kind of you know that you had phone calls with? There's someone kind of mentored you or someone that you went to or anybody that kind of reached out that you can think of. It was just you um, and Grant just pounding it. Well, Grant, I was pounding it. And, you know, I reached out to Tony Ballone one time, and um, he met me at Catalan for lunch. And uh, I just talked to him about restaurant business and being impressed with what he did and told him I'd worked for him years ago. He didn't remember, but I said, I was mm. a waiter for you. And now, you know, I have a few restaurants. And I wanted to know what his, you know, his recipe for success was, so mm. to speak. And we had a good conversation. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of events with uh, chefs over the years, Del Grande and all them. I've always had a lot of respect for those guys because uh, uh, they were doing it way before anyone else. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, then you got new guys. Uh, Benjamin over at b, &B Steakhouse mm -hmm. coming up. He has a few new, new concepts. Morgan Weber's group, you know, they got Cultivari and all that. Yeah. A, whole, a whole new breed coming up. And, uh, mm. you know, I just don't want to be that old guy in the kitchen at 60 years old, you know. I want to. I want to get in and get out, you know, open a few more concepts while I'm still having fun, but when it's not fun, just, you know, that's it. Mm. Right, cool. If you're at home, last question, if you're at home and the refrigerator has everything in it, what are you cooking? <laughs> oh, man, I'm probably making a sandwich. I like to toast a little uh, Wonder Bread, whatever bread it is, just toast it, that warm bread with mayonnaise and just like uh, some turkey breast or some chicken, but just just a warm sandwich, man. That's, that's usually it. what I make. I guess because it's the quickest thing to make. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, man. Listen, we sure do appreciate you coming in, taking time on your uh, Saturday. I know you needed this like a hole in the head, but uh, we love having you in here. And, and uh, you know, I want to get a show with maybe you and Chris, and maybe one or two other guys that you know. We had a we had what we call the Rat Pack show with with uh, Johnny and 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 Dimitri, uh, Dimitri and and uh, Arturo. I mean, it was a, it was a great show because they had so much respect for each other and, and, yeah. and how they came up. And so I'd like to have another show. Um, with maybe you and Chris and maybe a couple other guys. Yeah, I get, uh, yeah. a good guy would be Levi Good. Levi Good would be a good guy. We, cool. We kind of went to culinary school in the same era, and uh, even Brian Caswell would be a, a good guy. Yeah. He's full of life. Yeah, I haven't seen him forever. He just reopened Reef. He's opened dinner only um, in the bar area. He's slowly opening it. But, uh, still uh, with Bill Floyd still or no? No, they, they broke up there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. that's right. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, cool. no, no, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Hey, man, I appreciate you coming in and uh, and um, look forward to – we've done a few – couple gigs together. And yeah. Mostly uh, mostly harmless. Yeah. You make, <laughs> you, make them, you make them turn key. Easy. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you uh, always uh, jumping in and helping when people ask. So I want to – again, I want to thank all our sponsors for helping us out. Duncan Coffee, Ace Way Incorporated, Texas Beef Council, the Scott Faith School of Culling Arts, and American Culling Federation. Thank you guys all for – for trusting us with the show and, and again i want to um uh, thank uh, charles clark for coming in and and to make sure you guys are listening go check out his restaurants because they're fantastic and you got to call ahead because it's, it's busier in hell right? thank you appreciate it yeah so anywhere else people can find you chef on on uh well, websites or something like that or uh, uh clark cooper uh concepts uh, that'll take you to all our websites and you can see the restaurants and uh you know mother's day is coming up so i think we're 
full at most of the restaurants, but you know, if anybody needs a reservation, we just did. reach out. You know what? We did. My wife and I tried to try to uh, go to Dunleavy, and they said, uh, "What did they tell us? Um, don't take reservations." No, just yeah, just yeah. Reach out to me personally. I'll take care, I'll take care <laughs> of no, it. No, but they, yeah, the guys are booked out, so we knew that anyway. But um, but anyway, thanks for coming in, brother. Thanks. All right. Uh, this is uh, the recipe podcast. This is the gourmet club live uh, section, and we appreciate y'all listening. And by the way, by the way, I know you guys aren't getting the. Uh, I know a lot of our fans aren't getting the unplugged version of our show, the unplugged with our comedian Eric Knowles. And I know that because I can see you. I can see you. So make sure you go to the recipe unplugged and um, uh, uh, download that show. You have to download that show separately. Okay, and then subscribe. Once you subscri- subscribe, it'll go into your phone automatically. So go to the podcast icons, any, any uh, um, anywhere where you listen to your podcast, and download the recipe unplugged, and then you'll get that whole uh, comedy shows, all of them. There's, I don't know, a couple dozen up there now, so make sure you go there. So thank you so much for listening, and remember, you're especially great. Get off your ass and do something today. See you next time.